The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's special brown bag research seminar. My name is Nancy Holm. I'm assistant director here at ISTC. We have a number of uh, seminars coming up in the next few weeks, and flyers for those are available on the table outside the conference room here. And then also, um, for those who are viewing this, we have a listing of the events on our ISTC website. All of the seminars are recorded and will be archived on our website. So you can look for that usually four or five days after the seminar. We have that up on the website. I want to remind everyone here in the audience to please silence your cell phones. And also, we'll be taking questions at the end of the seminar. Uh, and for those of you viewing online, you can type in your questions at any time. Uh, and then we will take those at the end also. So today, we're very pleased to have with us Jennifer Wilcox, Assistant Professor in the Department of Energy Resources Engineering at Stanford University. Her research efforts include sorbent design and testing for carbon and trace metal capture from fossil fuels, absorption studies of carbon dioxide on oil and gas shells, and membrane design for N2 and H2 separations. She also heads the Clean Conversion Laboratory from the School of Earth Sciences at Stanford. Jennifer received a BA in mathematics from West Wellesley uh, College and an MA in physical chemistry and a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Arizona. She's recently co-authored the first textbook on carbon capture. And today uh, she will be presenting her uh, talk entitled Carbon Capture Using Nitrogen Selective Membrane Processes. So Jennifer. <laughs> All right. Thanks. All right. OK. So this just gives you a little idea of the group uh, that I uh, am working with at Stanford. And it's a group of students with really different and diverse backgrounds and uh, nationalities. The mission statement in my group is to tune and test materials for advanced energy conversion processes that minimize the environmental impact. And uh, these are a number of ongoing projects that are carried out in my group. But today, I'm going to focus specifically on the nitrogen selective membrane technology. And so before I get started on nitrogen selective membranes, I just wanted to talk about the scale of CO2 emissions. I think we're all familiar with it, but just, just get us all on the same page. And so thinking about the US population, we're just over 300 million people in the US. In China, 1.3 billion. If we think about the annual emissions per capita, in the US, we're about 17 and a half tons of CO2 per person per year. So based upon our American lifestyles, this is the CO2 that we're each responsible for. You might ask, well, what can I think of that weighs 17 and a half tons? And it turns out that a family of elephants weighs about 17 and a half tons. So each one of us is responsible for that much CO2 each year. If you look at China, it's about five tons of CO2 per person. If I think about my flight to Chicago from San Francisco, I emitted about 0.8 tons, and that's round trip, and that's just me on the flight. If I chose to drive here all the way to San Francisco, it would be around the same, about 0.7 tons. And that's if I took a Toyota Prius. If I, took, if I chose to take a BMW convertible, it would have been about double that. So it kind of gives you an idea the scale of emissions just based upon our own individual choices. Um, another thing to think about is 17 and a half tons is the amount of CO2 that we're each responsible for. But what about if we think about capturing that CO2? If you think about a technology like adsorption, how much sorbent material would it actually require in order to, for us each to capture the amount of CO2 that we emit on an annual basis? And due to the low loadings of CO2 on various sorbents, if I take the best one out there, it turns out that you're going to need 150 tons of material just to capture 17 and a half tons of CO2. So then you ask yourself, well, what weighs, this is the only quiz I'm going to give you today, what do you think weighs 150 tons? Any guesses? We'll stick with mammals. I heard somebody say it. Yeah, yeah, blue whale. So I have this slide because when I, I teach a course at Stanford called Carbon Capture and Sequestration. And a lot of times, the students certainly don't understand the scale of the CO2. Because they think, hey, well, let's just capture it. 
and you know have mountains and stuff around. Like you can put it in your backyard. Well, if you do that, you're going to have whales essentially stacked up in your backyard. And a lot of us don't have that kind of land. Actually, here in Illinois, you probably do. But in San Francisco in the Bay Area, we certainly don't. So that brings us to the point of regeneration. So if you're going to capture CO2, due to this scale, you have to regenerate the material that you use to do the separation process. And if we look at the current state-of-the-art technology, so this is a mean scrubbing, uh, say using monoethanolamine. If we look at the energy distribution, it looks like this. And so because it's an absorption process, you have these huge columns in which you have packing material, and you're essentially pumping your solvent down the packing material, blowing your gas up, and then this packing material has high surface area, so that you want intimate contact between the gas and the liquid phase so that that CO2 transfers into the solvent phase. And so solvent pumping is about 1% of the energy. Gas boiling is about 10%. But then you need to, again, regenerate the solvent. And so that's usually a thermal process when you're thinking about an amine. And that's about 56% of the total energy has to be regeneration. After that, and you have CO2 separated at some purity and some percent capture, you have to put it into a pipeline for transportation. And so there's compression associated with that. Compression is also a significant portion of this energy pie. And so this is the current state of the art. And then after regeneration and separation, the question is, what do we do with the CO2? And so thinking about, and this is the only slide I have where we talk about this, because then I'm going to move on. Um, but in chemical, uh, using CO2 as a chemical feedstock, turns out the markets are pretty small for this. Even if you look at the top 10 chemicals produced worldwide and said that you want to use CO2 as a feedstock for all of those, you could maybe take care of about less than 1% of the CO2 emissions globally. So turning CO2 into chemicals is interesting, but it's not going to solve the, the global warming issue. If we look at enhanced oil recovery, it's, it's a pretty significant market. Uh, you know, It seems that it could potentially, in the US, take care of about 10% of our emissions, uh, but that's, that's about it. So conversion to a fuel, this is the only market that actually scales with the emissions. But the problem is, is that CO2 and water vapor, the combustion products, are very thermodynamically stable. So in order to put those back into making fuel, we'll take energy. So if you do that, it's going to have to come from a non-carbonized energy source, or else you're going to produce more CO2 from the power used to create the fuels than the initial uh, fuels themselves. And then the big um, potential for sequestration is using uh, depleted oil and gas reservoirs. So where our oil and gas came from to begin with, we leave behind this porous media in the subsurface. Can we inject the CO2 back into that porous media? Or there are other opportunities like saline aquifers. Can these be used to sequester CO2 for long term? So the story to prevent 2 degrees C of warming, there was an article that came out in Nature in 2009. And what this is saying is that between the years 2000 and 2050, if we look at the cumulative emissions during this 50-year time period, if those cumulative emissions are on the order of 1,000 gigatons, then there will be a 25% chance probability that the globe will warm beyond 2 degrees C. If in that 50-year time span the emissions are on the order of 1440, that probability increases from 25% to 50%. So then we ask the question, well, where are we now? What are we doing now? So if we think about business as usual, and just thinking about BP Statistical Review of World Energy and looking at the annual expected increases of coal, oil, and natural gas, it turns out that if we keep continuing as we are today, in, those 50 year, in that 50-year time period, we're actually going to be responsible for about 1790 cumulative emissions. So that's well beyond 1440. So the probability is very high that if we keep down the trajectory that we have today, that the global warm well beyond 2 degrees C. And so I wanted to think about, well, what about expanding the impact of CCS? So CCS is usually discussed as a portfolio of solutions, others being increased energy efficiency, um, land management, like preventing deforestation, reforestation efforts, things like this. And so if we just look and specifically focus on CCS, what can we do? Suppose we took all the, and this is global, so suppose we took all coal and replaced it with natural gas. Where would that get us? If we do that, we end up having about 1,500 gigatons of CO2 cumulative over that 50-year time frame. So we're still going to be in a, in a situation where the probability is significant for warming. 
What if we took 90% of all the electricity sector worldwide? If we did 90% capture from all electricity, so that's coal and natural gas. That brings us down to about 1288. But we're still not really getting to the penetration we need in order to prevent 2 degrees C warming. So if you think about beyond electricity and you think about transportation, so suppose that there was electrification that happened with vehicles, or suppose that you did some direct air capture uh, or onboard capture of CO2, or even biofuels to some extent. So if you think of these kinds of things, if there's a way to think outside the box in terms of attacking the transportation sector in terms of CO2 emissions, this gets us a little deeper in terms of the, in terms of the CO2 uh, reductions. But these are really difficult problems to solve. So looking at the majority of the CO2 sources, turns out they are moderate to extremely dilute. So in this uh, table, what I'm showing is just the various categories of dilution and then examples, and then the percent CO2 volume. So in this case, for instance, coal-fired power plants, uh, the CO2 concentration is between 10 and 20 percent, natural gas boilers between 3 and 7 percent, the ambient air uh, quite dilute. And it turns out coal-fired power plants are about 40 percent of the emissions problem. And then gas, about 20 percent. Transportation sector is about 25 percent. And so these are the, the majority of the emissions, and they're really dilute systems. Dilute systems in CO2. So it's not an easy problem to solve. And this is where we're at. And so to kind of give you an idea of what, where CCS is today and what the progress is to date, the references here are from the IEA CCS Roadmap and the Global CCS Institute, both from 2013. So there's four large-scale CCS projects that have been carried out with monitoring sufficient to ensure injected CO2 is permanently sequestered. Combined, they, they combine to about 50 million tons of CO2 has been stored. There's nine additional projects under construction with about 13 million tons of CO2 per year is expected by 2016. There's also some industrial um, processes that are being looked at, like iron and steel plants. Uh, and although, again, attacking these kinds of emission sources is not going to be a huge impact, but the truth is, is that the concentration is much higher from some of these industrial sources. And so you might be able to learn something about CO2 separation, get the costs down by attacking some of these industry sources first, even though they're not going to have a huge impact. Um, CCS may be primary large-scale option for emissions reductions from the industrial sector, which represent about 20% of total global emissions. And then CO2 emissions from current systems under construction as of 2011 will total about 550 gigatons through 2035. And so according to the IEA, where should it be by 2050? It's saying that you know, CCS is definitely going to have to be an integral piece of the puzzle in order to um, get temperatures between 2 and 4 degrees C of warming. But the growth needs to increase from tens of millions of tons of CO2 per year up to gigatons. So millions of tons to gigatons. So it's a very significant increase in scale at which we need to carry out CCS in order to uh, be within these limits. And so they also look at the steps that are required. By 2020, uh, it must be successfully demonstrated in at least 30 projects, leading to over 50 million tons a year. By 2030, applications leading to over 2 gigatons uh, a CO2 per year of storage, and by 2050, it should be that CCS is routinely used to reduce emissions across power and industry sectors with over 7 gigatons of CO2 stored annually. And so we're really at the order of millions of tons today, but we need to be at gigatons in this time frame in order for us to prevent the warming. So, so now, like we, if I want to just now lead into the nitrogen work and kind of the uh, motivation to why we, we studied this. And so we looked back at this energy pie, and in my research, we focus both on membranes and adsorption. And I see some benefits associated with this uh, compared to, say, a solvent approach like MEA. With adsorption, you have the absence of water. Uh, you have the absence of corrosive solvents. Uh, and you also have greater options for choosing heat properties of various different materials. In terms of membranes, there's no regeneration. So potentially, this piece of the pie is removed. There's space efficiency associated with membranes and modular design of membranes, and there's no phase change. So there's some benefits associated with these approaches, which led us to uh, publishing this paper that actually it, it just came out uh, this fall. So that's available now. And also, it's what led me to write this book, uh, 
that was mentioned earlier in the introduction. And, and it's because right now the current state of the art technology is a mean scrubbing, but it's not, I'm not convinced that that's going to be the technology to tackle the emissions that we need to at the scale that we need to. We need to develop new technologies and think outside the box. Um, <clears throat> and so the team, the people that are working with me to carry this out are the students. The students and the postdocs are really the ones doing it. I'm really just the messenger of the results that, that they are uh, generating. And so the concept of a nitrogen selective membrane, so we have an equation here where we're describing the flux is equal to this mass transfer coefficient, uh, which is just the permeability, Q, divided by the thickness of the membrane, L. Permeability is divided by the product of the solubility and the diffusivity. So these are membrane properties. Solubility in our case meaning how soluble is our membrane to nitrogen. Diffusion meaning what's the diffusion or the diffusivity of nitrogen through the membrane. And here's the concept. It's a metallic membrane. And so in metals, you have a crystal structure, face center cubic or body center cubic. And in that crystal structure, you have different interstitial sites, crystal sites, octahedral sites and tetrahedral sites. And so what happens is the molecular nitrogen will catalytically dissociate into its atoms on the surface of the metal. And then those atoms are going to diffuse through by hopping through the interstitial sites of the actual metal crystal lattice. And it's the driving force of transport is due to the partial pressure gradient of nitrogen across the membrane. And so you can imagine you have this mixture of flue gas and the nitrogen catalytically dissociates and the atoms of nitrogen will come across. We recently got funding through NSF catalysis to look at this as an alternate, alternate way of making ammonia. So there haven't been a lot of... Uh, there hasn't been a lot of progress in advancing catalysts for the Haber-Bosch process for ammonia synthesis since it was invented since you know, 1905. And so we were looking at whether or not the nitrogen in this case is more reactive than it would be competing with hydrogen on a typical catalyst surface. So that's why we have this shown here. Now we're going to forget about ammonia and just focus on nitrogen selectivity of the membrane. And so some of the benefits associated with this you know, capturing CO2 on the high pressure side of the membrane may lead to cost savings in terms of compression energy. So you're bringing the nitrogen through, you leave CO2 here. So if we end up having to pressurize the feed, one of the questions we asked ourselves is, if we're pressurizing the feed, is there some optimization in doing that? Because we're using some of that compression energy that you saw in that energy pie as part of our process. And so we wanted to see if that would help us. Um, the other aspect is separate sol solubility and diffusivity studies indicate that nitrogen can move through metals. So that was the motivation behind this. When I first thought of this idea of a nitrogen selective membrane, I thought, well, you know, has anybody ever looked at this? Nobody had ever looked at it. But what I did find in the literature uh, was studies out of, uh, it was out of Sweden, I think, or maybe Norway. And what they were looking at is they were looking at the transport of nitrogen and the solubility of nitrogen into metals. And the reason why they're interested in that, it was for, uh, you know, the group five metals are refractory metals. They withstand very high temperatures. And so that group was interested in learning about these kinds of materials for nu nuclear reactors. And that they needed to know whether or not nitrogen or oxygen were leaking through those metals. And so that's why they were being studied, not at all for membrane purposes. And so I thought, well, in the literature, if they if they're giving information associated with solubility and diffusivity, there's no reason why I can't multiply them out and get a permeability and see if it's something that's measurable. And so that's where this all began. Um, and so this is the group that had done those experiments, uh, Kynonen, for the nuclear reactor application. And so what this plot is showing is just the diffusivity versus the temperature. And uh, in the red are hydrogen. So we know that we, can, we have palladium-based membranes that are used for hydrogen purification. And so the technology is pretty much identical, this nitrogen selective technology to hydrogen selective technology. And we know that hydrogen uh, technology is pretty advanced, these palladium membranes for hydrogen purification. So we thought, well, those would serve as good targets. If we can somehow get, you know, this is diffusivity. If we can somehow get our permeabilities of nitrogen in these materials up to that of hydrogen, then maybe we have something that's interesting. And so this is showing you, essentially, this is nitrogen is these solid circles here. It increases significantly as you increase temperature. This is in Kelvin. And then our hydrogen targets are here. 
But if you just look at, say, you know, 700 or so Kelvin, we're pretty far away. We're like five orders of magnitude. So it seems like hopeless when you see this, that will we ever get there? But we have to also remember that permeability is the product of the diffusivity and the solubility. So that solubility plays a significant role as well. And before I talk about this, I'll mention that we also, there was also some experimental data associated with solubility. Solubility of nitrogen in vanadium is much more significant than hydrogen in palladium. So in the end, your permeability, instead of it being five orders of magnitude different like diffusivity is, it's actually only a few. So it's like a few orders of magnitude difference because that solubility is so high. And I'll show some of that in a minute. And so in terms of our flux measurements, what we wanted to do is a proof of concept. So we built this um, high temperature membrane reactor. And this is uh, with a collaborator, Steve Paglieri from, from TDA Research, who was also a former student of Doug Ways at Colorado School of Mines. And that's who we're collaborating with now. And so if you look at this membrane module, the way that it's set up is on the inside here, we have a metallic foil, a diffusion barrier, um, a porous support, and then we just have gaskets to help either just carbon or graphite gaskets to help to make this tight. Everything here is made of, uh, in, uh, is made of in canal uh, because it's high temperature. And so what we're showing here is the feed is coming in, could be a mixture of CO2 and nitrogen. The nitrogen will selectively permeate through the, this metal disc. You can use a sweep gap, gas to help maintain the partial pressure driving force. And then the CO2 and whatever nitrogen that doesn't go through comes out through the retentate. And then we use a mass spec and a bubble flow meter over here to, in order to do the measurements on the back side. Some of the results that we've gotten, so that we've tested a couple of group 5 metals, vanadium and niobium. We could also look at tantalum. And so this is showing nitrogen permeability. And so if we want to compare, say, to hydrogen permeability, the, the ballpark we want to get to is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 8 in these units. And so what we're looking at here is we're only one order of magnitude away from that. It's not horrible if we look at vanadium. So we're just one order of magnitude away. If we look at the CO2 permeability, what we're showing is the CO2 permeability is, is actually lower than nitrogen by five orders of magnitude. And we're expecting that the CO2 might permeate through if there's any kind of defects in these metals, like any kind of pinholes. That's the only way. Some Knudsen diffusion is the only way that the CO2 is going to actually go through. So our selectivity is very significant. So uh, again, proof of concept. We wanted to look at these metal foils before and after. This is just pure vanadium. So we can see this perfect peak here in an X-ray diffraction uh, result. And then afterwards, we show some nitride formation. So when, I, when we talk about permeability and we talk about it being the product of the solubility and diffusivity, yes, definitely the solubility is high. Nitrogen and vanadium, it's too high. And that's why we get these nitrides forming. And that's actually a problem for us. So what we wanted to do is say, well, how can we design a new material such that the solubility isn't quite as strong? And then also, if the solubility is not as strong, maybe that helps us to make it so that the, the nitrogen atom will actually diffuse through the lattice a little bit easier. So we wanted to examine that. The best way to examine that kind of atomistic structure and nitrogen interaction with the atomistic structure is through uh, modeling. And so we do something called density functional theory, where we can screen uh, materials on a large number of metals to get an idea of actually how that atomic nitrogen is interacting with its surrounding metals, metal atoms. And so you can see here um, this crystal structure. It's just body-centered cubic, because you've got for instance, the red are the, just the uh, BCC atoms, say, of vanadium. And so they're occupying the body of the, of the cube. And then here is an octahedral site. So if you look at the nearest neighbors and you count the number of faces, it's just eight. And that's why it's octahedral site. And so the nitrogen atom, the blue one, is sitting in this octahedral site. And so what we're doing is, is we look at, we can calculate the solubility directly from the binding energy and also the vibrational frequency that nitrogen has with its neighboring metal atoms in that crystal. And so we can, we can use modeling to calculate a solubility. And we can also use modeling to calculate diffusion of nitrogen through the metal. And we can compare both of those to experiment to benchmark our models. What we can also do is we can look at materials that haven't been developed yet because of this. So instead of doing experiments and just mixing things together and testing, and that can be very expensive, we can use this as a guide or provide insight into new materials that have improved properties. 
And so through this modeling, what we found is that we found that if we alloy vanadium with ruthenium, we get a significant decrease in solubility of nitrogen. And we haven't, we haven't actually modeled the diffusion yet, but we're expecting enhanced diffusivity as well. And so <clears throat> what this is showing here, it's a lot of information. I'm going to just have you focus on a few different pieces of it. Pure vanadium, and then these are alloys of vanadium with ruthenium. And by the way, these aren't cluster studies. Uh, these are periodic images, and I've just taken a bit of one of these big, huge images. I've just taken a piece, but it's periodic in all directions. And so the binding energies in blue here are showing how strongly nitrogen binds to that site in this metal. And so that binding energy, the, the larger the negative number, the more stable it is. So the binding here in pure vanadium is very strong at negative 2 electron volts. Don't worry about the units. We're just comparing across. If I start to look at alloying with ruthenium, I see I go from negative 2 electron volts all the way to this weakening of 0.8, negative 0.8 electron volts. So it's a significant decrease just by changing some of these atoms with ruthenium. And it has to do with both space and electron negativ electronegativity of, of the, of the um, differences between, say, nitrogen and the neighboring atoms. And so if we go back to the hydrogen case, which we want to keep thinking about as our target, hydrogen binding in vanadium is on the order of either 0.7 or 0.28, depending on which site it resides in. So you can see here, we're kind of, you know, as we alloy, we can tune these materials and we can influence and impact um, the solubility and the binding energy. So it's these studies that are leading us to the next stage, which is making alloys um, of vanadium and ruthenium. But it turns out making alloy-based uh, membranes is really difficult. And this is you know, something that we've been working on for a long time. So some of the different strat strategies that we've looked at are sputtering, evaporation, and chemical vapor deposition. And so these are just, you know, um, this is exactly where we're at right now. So there are some benefits and, and limitations associated with each of these uh, approaches. And so some of these, um, for instance, with sputtering, we have shared equipment at Stanford in the nanofabrication facility. And we have a collaborative effort uh, with the material sciences engineering at Stanford and also uh, TDA research in Colorado School of Mines. And again, evaporation is something that we might be able to do because uh, of shared equipment and, and CVD as well. But the problem with shared equipment is, is that somebody else is using it too. And so they may not want just any metal in their system. And so we kind of have to abide by whatever rules um, the, the multi-user facility has. So when we look at some of the shared facilities, for instance, we have this E-beam evaporator. If we look at each of these different um, opportunities, and we look at these different metals that we have at our disposal, if we were looking at hydrogen selection, we'd be great, because palladium is great for, for hydrogen selective membranes, but we're not. We actually have another project where maybe we'll do that, but for nitrogen, the only option here is really tantalum, because that's another group 5 metal. So maybe we can do something with tantalum uh, if we want to use what's available to us. And same with this one here. We see that there's tantalum available. So it, it kind of, you know, we have the option of using a multi-user facility, but it's, it's limited, as you can see. The other issue we have is the, f so there's two different approaches that we're taking. What I showed you is this disk format. And the reason why, I mean, in, in a real membrane separ uh, separation process, you would have modular units. And these membranes are tubes. And the catalytic um, part that does the selective removal from the mixture is deposited on like a porous stainless steel support. And they're just, it looks like a huge heat exchanger with a bunch of tubes. And so we have a membrane reactor that's tubular as well, but it's really expensive to coat those tubes. So we use the little disks more for proof of concept because it's something smaller and we are more, have more control over it. And it's something we can kind of try and do in-house. And so, but now we're at this point where those disks, so you need a support, as I showed. But those pore supports, oftentimes the pores are too large if we go with a commercial vendor for the supports. And we've tried all sorts of things, like coating to try and make the pore size more uniform. Uh, we just have not been able to do it. The nitrogen fluxes are really small. And so when we go to do the metal deposition, on the surface, the actual metals that fall through the holes, 
of the support. So it hasn't been working for us. So now what my PhD student, and this is a big part of a PhD, is, OK, well, let's make our own supports if they're not available commercially. So that's what we started to do. And so in order to really get you know, the grain size and then to center it and get those supports uh, uniform, she's not, you know, you're not going to use stainless steel. She's using ceramic. But now you need to make sure you have a good seal between the ceramic and the metal. And you also need to make sure that the ceramic is going to withstand the pressure of the module. And so this is now, I mean, every step of the way, you know, as a PhD student, it probably wasn't that far for some of you. I see some young people here, too. And, uh, and it's just, and those of us that are even far removed, you still remember your PhD because it's that kind of an experience, right? And so it's just, you know, at this point what we're trying to do, now she's putting in a couple of these graphite gaskets to try and absorb some of the pressure. We have a torque wrench so we know exactly how much, you know, we're applying um, each time. And then we're met, but it's one of these things where uh, it's like the Schrodinger's cat, you know. It's uh, you've got this black box, and you turn it, and you hope that the ceramic doesn't break. And then when you measure the flux, you're like, oh, I've got some high flux, but is that because I've I've cracked my support, or is that because that's how the material is working? And you don't, and when you open it, you don't know when it cracked. So it's kind of a tricky situation, but this is kind of where we're at um, with it. And so we're at the point where we're making our own ceramic supports, but again, like. Part of why I'm here is, is thinking about collaborations and, and trying to work with other people that might have this expertise in helping us. So another aspect of the project is if we're going to use this for a power plant, how are these materials going to withstand the real flue gases? So real flue gases means that we have NO, NO2, which comprise NOx. We have SO2. We also have SO3 to some extent, especially if there's an SCR catalyst in the power plant. And we have vapor right, water vapor. And so we've looked at a couple of studies um, where we've exposed the vanadium to uh, SO2, water vapor, NO, and NO2. So these are some uh, of our concentrations. So SO2, 425 ppm, NO, 230, NO2, 12. Uh, you know, this is just characteristic of Appalachian low sulfur, but we did look at a high elevated SO2 content. This is from IECM, which was a, a, it's a software package developed by Ed Rubin from Carnegie Mellon, Integrated Environmental Control Module. Um, and then this is just what we've done. We exposed clean vanadium in each of these gas species at 600 degrees C, which is an optimal range for the membrane to react at, for one hour, three hours, and five hours. And then we looked at uh, the surface characterization with X-ray photo emission spectroscopy using two different instruments. Essentially, one is old and one is newer. That's what we can think of, but they're pretty consistent. <clears throat> so in this case, um, these are the blank vanadium samples. And uh, just looking at um, exposure, in this case, uh, nit just nitrogen. But I'm going to go to the more interesting ones. So in this case, we're looking at sulfur exposed, 495 ppm vanadium samples, unsputtered. We are gathering our sputtered results, too. So what that means is we have argon that we can use to sputter the surface and take some of the first few molecular layers off the surface so that we can see um, if, I mean, it's more interesting, say, too, you know, it could be, what if we pull this out of our system, our reactor, it had sulfur on the surface in the reactor, we pull it out and it's exposed to oxygen, and then the oxygen gets on the surface and, and then that's what we're seeing and that's why we don't see sulfur. Because it's an XPS as a surface sensitive instrument. So we want to make sure that we're seeing uh, what we think we're seeing. So we still have some things to do, but, but on a first pass, you know, the light blue here, we're not really seeing sulfur stick to the surface. Part of it is, is that vanadium isn't vanadium anymore either. It, it does turn into vanadia because it's such a reactive surface. And so the surface is an oxide. If we were to turn this a little bit and think of pre-combustion capture and hydrogen selective membranes using palladium, H2S kills those membranes. Okay. It's a huge problem. Palladium copper kind of gets you around it a little bit, but still, it's a big problem, hydrogen sulfide. But nobody's ever looked at metallic membranes in an oxidizing environment before. They have had no reason to. And so what we're finding is that SO2 doesn't stick to the surface. And it might be because we already have an oxide on the surface. So SO2 is an oxide. It may not want to stick to the surface. Where palladium is pretty clean. 
you know, and it's, it's the hydrogen of the hydrogen sulfide that interacts so strongly with that surface. That's the mechanism that it binds. But we're not seeing any sulfur. And so similarly, when we look at exposure to NO, um, we had some sodium contamination in here, which is what we're seeing, but we're not seeing uh, too much NO stick to the surface. And then also if we look at NO2, uh, similarly, you know, we're not seeing a whole, a whole lot. And then water vapor um, in this case. And so in terms of water vapor, again, it, it's hard to, to, to look at this because it's really, these are percents of the total is how XPS, uh, you know, gives this. And so, you know, the, it's essentially, if you see the O like that, you're already high because it's vanadia on the surface. So whether or not, you know, it's just kind of difficult too to distinguish between the oxygen of water versus the oxygen of what's already there. So that gives you just a little bit of an idea. I think it's promising to say that we might have limited interactions with sulfur with these kinds of materials. But then we did an optimization study to think about, well, where does this technology fit best? And so what we tried to do is just um, different configurations of nitrogen selective membranes. And this was published in Journal of Membrane Science. Uh, and just to give you an idea, so we have this first configuration where we say, okay, we're going to put a pure, a single stage nitrogen selective membrane in our flue gas at high temperature. And we're going to look at potentially compressing the feed and, uh, and, and then thinking about what's the energy hit on the power plant if you do this. You know, and what do you want in the end? 90% capture, 95% purity of CO2. And then we looked at a configuration where we have a nitrogen selective membrane with pressurization on the first stage of the feed. Um, but it's two stage here. Another one where we have two stage nitrogen, no pressurization on the feed. So it's just the feed comes in as is, because remember it's a partial pressure driving force. Then we looked at hybrid configurations where we said, okay, well what if we just use this as a CO2 enricher? So we pull some of the nitrogen out and leave behind a concentrated stream of CO2 so that now we can use a CO2 selective approach as a second step. And so when we do that, we actually did find one interesting case. Um, and so we plot energy use versus total membrane area. And so the promising application, the CO2 enrichment here, um, gives us on, the, on this second axis here, the energy pel and the penalty, the percent of gross generated, so somewhere around 22% of um, the energy of the plant. And then, of course, you know, as you go down to that low range, you have to increase your surface area. So it shows that this optimization of how much surface area versus the energy requirement. And I think you know, it's, it's good to separate these into two pieces. If we later extrapolate this to costs, you can think of the operating and maintenance costs associated with the energy term and the capital costs associated with the surface area term. We have to be careful because I think with membrane separations, the vacuum technology is also really expensive and, and consumes a lot of the cost. So that has to go into the capital as well. And so in summary, I think what I've shown is that we have um, a proof of concept with vanadium, but we really need to you know, use in this DFT as, as a platform for learning about these new materials and these alloys, given that ruthenium significantly reduces the uh, nitrogen stability of vanadium and enhances potentially diffusion, brings down solubility. The fact that vanadium seems to be withstanding acid gases is, is definitely of interest, and, and the fact that we might use these as a CO2 enricher. Uh, and then future work will involve investigation using aspen. Also, the impact of removing nitrogen on the remainder of the power plant. So if you have a power plant and now you're removing a lot of that, uh, that inert gas of nitrogen, how does that impact the performance of all of the other pieces, the unit operations of the plant? Could it enhance the efficiency of the plant, potentially, or of a new plant? And so future work will involve the investigation of synthesizing alloys and then their subsequent testing. And just to acknowledge, uh, Steve Paglieri is our, our collaborator on this and students from my group again. And some of the funding so far, Army Research Lab, EPA, and NSF. And then a nice picture of where, I'm, where I get to spend my time. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yep. 
Okay, um, if there's questions here in the audience, we'll take those first. Does anyone have a question for Jennifer this time? The general question is, uh, you mentioned that uh, H2S, although there is no H2S in flue gas, but H2S uh, will chew up the metal memory. But one way in flue gas, there is like HCl. So probably it's a little bit similar to H2S. So one way, <laughs> maybe in future, probably, you know, H2, HCl probably is a potential component to look at. Yeah. Yeah, then second question is, uh, what kind of a configuration you imagine, such as tube or uh, frame or plate type of a membrane for the uh, uh, practical application? What configuration you think is uh, best? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the first one um, having to do with HCl, that's really easy for us to test too because a lot of the work in our group, we, we look at mercury oxidation. So we have it. And we can easily uh, we can look at that, and I just didn't even think of it. So because I was I was kind of stuck on sulfur and NOx. So yeah, we can do that. We'll do we'll do that next. Uh, the other the other um, aspect is in terms of what configuration. I'm thinking about. I mean, the closest the largest scale I've I've seen of thinking about hydrogen selective membranes in palladium is there's you know most of these applications are really small scale, so. Hydrogen production primarily is from natural gas today, and it's typically steam methane reforming with a pressure swing adsorption setup, not a metallic membrane. So these membranes don't actually scale up terribly well. And so, um, but MTR and WPI, Worcester Polytech Institute with uh, EDMA, has a project that's funded it. They got the second stage DOE, and they have a skid set up at the National Carbon Capture Center in Alabama where they're testing it for IGCC. And I would try and model a system like that, because that's, that would be a good facility uh, for us to test this technology at for, for post-combustion capture, but mimic their pre-combustion setup that they already have sitting right there. And so that would be a really good, I think, template to work from. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions here? Uh, great presentation. So uh, my quick question is, since um, typically the flue gas is going to be so hot and you know you, you might have other elemental compositions which is more anions and cations, do you think these has an effect on the vanadium membrane surface? You know it's, it's get, you said, you mentioned that it's going to get oxidized and you know forms a vanadia, but there could be other um, you know anions that could also affect it apart from the chloride and sulfate. So um, <clears throat> I would expect some sort of like um, sulfates, phosphates, those type of things. Yes, um, they um, the aerosols. I mean, typically um, from um, emission measurements, these are some aerosols formations at a very they they get partitioned out to the particulate phases and to the gas phases. So some of these gas phases. Yes. Oh, okay. So, so at, I mean, you, I think what you're thinking about is you've got water interacting with SO2 to form hydrogen, uh, you know, H2SO4. Definitely that happens, but that happens as the flue gases quench. So as you cool, you know, you start off at 1100 degrees C at the boiler exit, and then you have like an SCR catalyst that's between 400 and 600 degrees C. That's where we're thinking of this being housed. So as you leave the stack, you're at, you know, anywhere from 40 to 60 degrees C. That's when you get those kinds of transformations. So I don't, I don't think it's going to be too much of an issue at, at the higher temperature. But that's a good point. Thanks. Um, any other questions here? Sure, Kevin and Robert. Do we have any online? Not at this time. Okay, Kevin. Well, very nice presentation, uh, Jennifer. A uh, question you mentioned about the vanadium and the effect of the ruthenium on that. Uh, based on that, do you have any? Uh, could you make any comments as to uh, how you would see that? You know, what would be kind of your ideal alloy based on your knowledge base at this time? Uh, 
Uh, at this point, we're looking at about 10% ruthenium and 90% vanadium. And so, and we're at the stage where we've ordered those targets. So we've ordered those metal targets to do uh, the sputtering in Will Chu's lab in material science engineering on the little disks, the, the ceramic disks that we've made. Uh, and then we've also um, ordered them for the tubular supports that we've sent out to Colorado School of Mines. But we're stuck right now because they're very expensive and we need to get some funding in order to pay for them. But we have the quote and he's got the targets and he's got the tubes. So once we get the funding, then we'll be able to actually have that metal deposited on those supports. Yeah. So we're close. So what was the assumed permeability of the nitrogen for your simulations that was shown? And are you close to that assumed number? So we have a high and a low. And the high would be that target that we're trying to get for hydrogen, and the low would be the order of magnitude lower that I showed in that one plot, because we've gotten about with an order of magnitude in pure vanadium. But who knows what we'll see. Maybe we'll get an alloy that will perform even better. But those are the two extremes. Yeah. Yes. It's an optimal, actually. So, so when you multiply, you have the solubility and the diffusivity. And so one of these is stronger than the other, typically. And so in our case, it turns out that that solubility term is quite strong. And so, yes. So, but, but you're right. It really depends on the material and it depends on the gas. And, and, and you, see these, you see these permeability, uh, often there's a maximum. Because there's two dueling factors, there's the, the solubility and the uh, diffusivity. And that solubility trend is not always the case, such that, for instance, um, you, you know, it's also temperature dependent. And so that's another issue. But um, it, it's not so straightforward. As you increase temperature, if that hi in the case of hydrogen, if the hydrogen is loosely bound in the system, then it acts as a gas phase, right? So as you increase temperature, it wants to be more volatile and it will come out. So the solubility decreases with increasing temperature. If the hydrogen is bound really strong, then it turns out it's more of an activated uh, barrier that you can kind of overcome and your solubility increases with increasing temperature. So it's like it's not even, even with temperature versus, you know, the material and hydrogen versus nitrogen, it's all kind of complicated and you have to look at each scenario individually. So the question is whether or not you might form amalgams with mercury. Uh, maybe you, you, know, you might. You have high temperature. But mercury is present in parts per billion concentrations. So the impact that that's going to have is, is pretty low. Uh, globally, if you combine all the power plants, we emit on the order of 5,000 tons of mercury worldwide. So it's a pretty small number compared to what we're thinking in terms of nitrogen gas. Even so, I mean, 5,000 tons worldwide per year. So it, it's just a very small number. You know, and, and if it does form an amalgam, a lot of the work out of um, Evan Granite's group at NETL has shown reversibility of these things, too. So that mercury is just so volatile. It's exactly how we separate mercury from gold. In gold mining, we heat it up, and it comes off. So it's not a, a terrible, you know, I, I wouldn't imagine it would be difficult. Any other questions here? Robert, any online? Okay, with that, I'd like to uh, thank Jennifer again for her presentation today. And uh, we'll hope to have everyone here for the next seminar on November 7th. Excuse me.